Hello, my name is Chad Merrill, and I will be reading a story that I wrote. Um, it's called Happy Birthday, Lydia Carter, and it is definitely a work in progress, but I'm excited to share it. If you follow me on Twitter, um, you may recognize this as the story I was tweeting about. Crystal was scheduled to hang tonight, and I guess that's what has me thinking about Lydia Carter. I played soccer with Lydia in high school. She gave me and half the team mono when we passed around a water bottle once after practice. She told people later that we'd had a lesbian orgy, and when she said it, it came off as funny, not weird. Nothing was weird for Lydia. She could squint at anything and make it instantly cool or uncool. I remember that squint from my first day of seventh grade. I was the new girl. My mother and I having moved in with her parents after my dad died on his second tour in Iraq. Mother grieved by sleeping through mornings and dancing through nights at the town's lone bar. My grandparents sighed at each other over my mother's empty space at the dinner table, and I felt I knew what it must be like to have a troubled teenage sister. Nobody looked out for me, except Crystal. Upon being subjected to Lydia's uncool squint and rejected by the rest of our seventh grade class, I was taken in by Crystal. I never could have guessed that she'd go on to be a serial killer. Don't worry, Crystal told me. They're all a bunch of bozos anyway. The kids called her Crystal Meth because her mother was doing time at County, although I think it was actually for crack. At the D.A.R.E. assembly that year, the officer showed us mugshots of people on drugs, pointing to the rotten teeth, arms scratched until blood seeped out. I felt Crystal tense in the seat next to me, but it wasn't until sixth period that she told me, they showed my mom up there. Which one? I asked. She had the real big eyes, Crystal whispered, and her hair was like... She motioned a certain messiness around her scalp. Oh, yeah, I said, although I could not recall the image. Every mugshot had crazy eyes and wild hair. For weeks I would be haunted by the night terrors of gum-gnashing women gibbering nonsense, like Jono, who slept behind the Conoco and spent afternoons in the town's sole traffic light shouting at trucks. In these dreams, each of these women is Crystal's mom. The day of Lydia Carter's boy-girl birthday party, we robbed the Conoco. Crystal and I turned out to be the only people in our entire 27-person, 7th grade class who had not been invited to Lydia's birthday, so we decided to have a party of our own. We planned a sleepover, and I stuffed an extra set of clothes in my backpack and told my mother I had a soccer game after school. Soccer season had ended weeks ago, and anyway, I hadn't made the team that year, so it was a dopey excuse, but she bought it curled up in bed and flicking her long green nails at me to go away and shut the goddamn door. Crystal lived on Barnwood Street, a dirt road on the north edge of town where nobody ever went on purpose. That day we set up a picnic blanket in the road and laid back to see how long we could sit there before a car forced us out of the street. We gave up after three hours. Now it seems impossible that either of us could have sat in one place that long with only the sky for entertainment, but we did. We asked each other a lot of questions. How well did I know my dad? How well did she know her mom? What's the worst name you were ever called? She asked. My mom had called me enough things that what the girls at school said didn't faze me, but I saw Crystal flinch when they took verbal jabs at her, so I made something up. I got called a slop-slinging, fat-ass pig by this guy at my last school. I made a piggy oink and shook my butt. Crystal laughed at that. Later, she would be called a crack whore, unworthy of life or love, and America's ugliest serial murderer. But that afternoon, on the blanket under a lazy autumn sky, Crystal lowered her eyes in shame and told me, Lydia Carter called me a dyke once. Her brown irises softened like bruises. I tried to change the subject. What's the worst thing you ever did? I asked. I killed a bird once, she said, and her face grew pale and still. A baby bird, without feathers even. 
It must have fallen from its nest. I found it on the ground. She pointed to the approximate place in her front yard. It had ants on one wing. Tiny black ants, the kind that eat dead things. The bird wasn't dead yet, but they were already eating it. It made this little cheeping sound. She was whispering again. I wanted to put it back in its nest, but I heard that mama birds kill their babies if they've been touched by people. They can smell it on them. So I stomped its head in. Crystal's eyes were swimming in tears now, and I wondered how I could have made the conversation even more depressing than it already was. Hey, do you want to go to Conoco? I asked. She sprang up like a Pop-Tart. Yeah, she said, but I've got to get my irrigation boots on first. When Crystal's face lit up BuzzFeed and Yahoo News with sensational headlines like Frat Massacre at Virginia and Devil Horse Slays Five, I couldn't help but think that her mugshot looked exactly like the woman from my nightmares in seventh grade. Crystal claimed that the frat boys hired her for a party, gang raped her, and then only paid a third of the fee she was promised because she was too ugly. Ten days later, she stormed the fraternity, shot four boys, and when she ran out of bullets, stabbed a fifth in the neck. Before long, they'd connected her to a similar incident in Georgetown, and she was branded a serial killer. The prosecutor said she hadn't been raped because she was paid for it, called the fact that she did not get her promised fee an unfortunate misunderstanding. Her Twitter account, which she used to find clients, and in which she revealed everything but her face, he cited as, false advertising. He went on to say, frankly, if they knew what they were getting into, these boys would not have hired you at all. The jury found her guilty. The judge gave her death. The trick to robbing the Conoco, Crystal told me, is you've got to buy something. If you buy something, they won't think you're trying to rob them. Her irrigation boots, which were really her father's and were several sizes too large, flailed and flopped as we walked to the store. Crystal's was one of the properties connected to the irrigation canal that ran through town. She invited me for irrigation day once, and I watched her twist open the spigot coming out of her lawn with a giant metal key. She splashed in the rush of water, claiming it was fun, but it froze my feet, and as the water rose in her backyard, so did dozens of little dog turds, which troubled me because Crystal did not own a dog. We pooled our pocket change in the Conoco lot. I had my three lucky nickels, a lucky dime, and two lucky quarters. What makes them lucky? Crystal asked. They were made in my birth year, I said. I don't want to spend them. Crystal had a quarter and three pennies. She dumped them into my hand. Good luck, she said. I'll be getting the goods in the candy aisle. I stood in front of the cheap candy at the checkout stand and squinted as if I couldn't quite make up my mind. The cashier had a large white bandage taped to his balding scalp. It shone like a little patch of snow in the LED lights. Behind me, I heard Crystal clomping through the aisles, secretly dropping candy bars into her boots. We were the only ones in the store. I grabbed an orange Tootsie Pop, and the cashier sighed as if I'd disappointed him. 26 cents, he said. Crystal's coins tinkled onto the counter, and she stepped up next to me. Hey, she said, gripping the sucker. This one has a star on the wrapper. We get another one free. The cashier's scowl deepened. Miss, he said, there's no promotion with the Tootsie Roll Company. He was cut off by none other than John O, who barged into the store demanding, Give me those cigarettes. Crystal snatched a few Tootsie Pops in her fist and whispered to me, Run. We flew. Years later, after she dropped out of school and her father kicked her out of the house, Crystal showed me her cabin in the woods. It consisted of a few branches leaned up against a ledge and covered in a tattered blue tarp. We crawled inside so she could prove to me it kept her warm. She kept a fetid pile of blankets in one corner and what looked like a stack of men's clothing in another. You got money? I asked her. The kids at school said she was turning tricks. I get by, she said. Hey, you know John O? Sometimes he comes out here and sleeps with me. Crazy John O? I asked from behind the gas station. You're dating him? Yeah, she said. She nudged the ground with a tattered shoe. I mean, kind of. Hey, do you got a smoke? I did. She whipped out a lighter and lit it. Her skin shone blue under the tarp. Isn't he like 40? I asked. We would have both been about 16 then. 
I don't know why somebody didn't call CPS. I don't know why I didn't call CPS. At the time, I don't think I even knew what CPS was, except that my mother was always worried someone would call them on us if I went out in the winter without a coat or something. Crystal blew out a string of smoke. Her smile cracked her face in half. I don't know, she said, laughing. And suddenly I was too. I've got no idea how old he is. We kicked our feet up and fell backwards, clutching our ribs and then clutching each other, our bright faces inches away, screaming our hilarity back and forth like a miserable game of ping pong. Back at her house, Crystal dumped the boot's contents onto the kitchen table. I didn't know what you liked, she said, so I got a little of everything. The dozen multicolored packages winked up at us. We split a bag of Skittles and then a Snickers bar. This is great, but what's for dinner, I asked. She squinted as if trying to translate what I was saying into something understandable. I tried again. Do you have any leftovers or anything? She opened the fridge to reveal its contents. One shelf full of beer bottles and a half gallon of milk, a stale chunk of cheese, hopelessly limp celery. What do you normally have for dinner? I asked her. Crystal shrugged and pulled out a beer. Won't your dad notice if it's missing? She grinned. You're crazy if you think my dad can count past five, she said. We sat on the grimy pink linoleum and passed the bottle between us. It was my first beer, and I grimaced through it, taking deep draws to prove that I could. By the bottom of the bottle, I felt warm and loose, my joints butter soft. I couldn't imagine what another beer might do to me. We had another. I'm still hungry, I told her. How about some hot chocolate, she asked. We filled two mugs with milk and placed a three musketeers bar in each. She put the whole thing in the microwave until the chocolate melted. Crystal, I said, this is the best hot chocolate I've ever had in my life. I know, she giggled. By then it was dark. We could see our reflections in the kitchen windows. For some reason, there was no overhead lighting in Crystal's house, and we shuffled through the rooms, groping for lamps. I battered my shins on furniture, stepped into piles of trash and discarded clothing. Here, said Crystal, thrusting her hand in mine. After that, we made it to her room all right. We hadn't thought about sleeping arrangements, but seeing her skinny bed wedged into a corner of her room, the orange sheets tangled in the lamplight, I knew there was no comfortable place I could sleep. And I hadn't brought any pajamas. I imagined, naively, that Crystal might have provided a matching set for both of us, something we could photograph ourselves in and prove that we had a good time without Lydia Carter. Crystal slithered out of her clothes and into a wholly oversized t-shirt that read, The Man, The Legend, with one arrow pointing up and another pointing down. I have another old shirt if you want, she said. I sleep in my underwear, I lied. We slipped into bed, too lazy to shut off the lamp in the opposite corner. It was missing its shade and the naked bulb glared yellow. What do you think they're doing now? Crystal asked, at the party. I suspected the party ended hours ago. They're kissing, I said. They've shut off the lights and everyone has found a private corner to kiss. Who'd you choose? asked Crystal, sitting up, her eyebrows launching onto her forehead. Who'd you choose if you could kiss anyone in our class? It was easy. Todd Murphy, I said. Crystal threw her shoulders back. With one fist, she pulled her dark hair up and away from her face. Hey, it's me, Todd, she said, her voice now exaggeratedly low. You enjoying the party? She failed to suppress her smirk. In her normal voice, she urged, you be Lydia, okay? I shook my head wildly, tossing my hair into a frenzy. Oh, Todd, I said, throwing my chest out to accentuate my non-existent breasts. This has been the best birthday of my life. So, this is kind of awkward, but Crystal Todd looked down in mock embarrassment. They shut out the lights, and uh, I think we're supposed to kiss. A birthday kiss, I hissed as sensually as I could. I imagined glossed lips bleach blonde hair, a new organdy dress. I leaned close enough to see each blackhead on Crystal's nose. How wonderful, I said. She wrapped her hands around my face and whispered back in her normal voice. Happy birthday, Lydia Carter. As we kissed, I thought, Todd, Todd, 
Todd, but these were not Todd's lips sliding against mine. This was not his tongue, thick and slug-like in my mouth, and still I kissed back. We kissed harder, and our teeth clinked. Crystal's hand moved from my head to my back and shoulders, our mouths now clumsy and frantic. My fingers slid under her man-legend t-shirt, hungry, searching for something. I wonder now if I would have recognized it, even if I found it. Crystal had been the first girl I ever kissed. About the time she was convicted, I kissed my second. By the night of Crystal's execution, after years of appeals, retrials, and media slander, I had partnered with a woman named Sydney in Cincinnati. I told this whole story to Sydney as we opened a cheap bottle of Merlot and waited for midnight when the execution would take place. Were you her first kiss? Sydney asked. I shook my head. I didn't know. We never talked about it, I said. The past few days, we'd listened to true crime podcasts, watched a YouTube documentary about Crystal, saw clips of protests to end the death penalty. The hardest was watching Crystal's girlfriend testify. Those boys were so cruel to her, she said in a bruised Boston accent, and I gripped Sydney's hand until she wrenched it from me. Now we had nearly half an hour till midnight. We put on a Nina Simone record and waited. When we ran out of wine, I went to the kitchen and warmed milk on the stove, dropping in many Three Musketeers bars until the color was just right. What's this? Sydney asked when I gave her a mug. Try it, I urged. Oh my gosh, she said when she did, and I smiled. I hadn't had Crystal's hot chocolate recipe since she first showed it to me. I found it much too sweet now. The record ended, spinning into silence. I felt Sydney's hand on my back. Whatever happened to Lydia, she asked me. She has a family, I said. Two beautiful girls. I don't know why some people are given the kind of lives you can show on Instagram, and others have their mugshots used to scare kids. I don't understand it at all. The worst thing that ever happened to Lydia Carter, so far as I could tell, was that last year I turned down her offer to join her pyramid scheme selling dietary supplement shakes. The clock boomed midnight. I imagined the horrible face in Crystal's mugshot contorting and then settling limply into death. I counted to 12 with the chimes and I wondered what was the worst thing that had happened to me? Thank you. Hi there, I'm Turner Wilson and today I'm going to be introducing Matthew Miller. I feel blessed to have met Matt. Uh, to have seen his creative process in action, and to have read poetry with him on a couple of occasions. The first thing that springs to mind about both Matt and his poetry is his incredible sincerity. Matt writes with a rare kind of verve on every subject he covers, from the complexities of Midwestern masculinity to the extraterrestrial wanderings of alley cats. He unleashes linguistic pyrotechnics on each line that, despite their brightness, don't overpower the delicacy and sensitivity of his work. Because of this, Matt has won awards such as the Dean Joseph H. Cash Award for Excellence in Writing, a U Discover Grant, the Archer Gilfillan Scholarship, and was a 2017 Parks and Points Essay Contest finalist, as well as the runner-up for the 2017 Norton Writers' Prize. His work has been featured in Eckleburg, Sink Hollow, All the Universe Shining, Oakwood, Pask Petals, The Norton Field Guide to Writing, and is forthcoming in the anthology South Dakota in Poems. His chapbook, Brave and Stupid, is published by Dream Cult House Press. Please welcome my friend, Matthew Miller. Hi there. Uh, my name is Matthew Miller. Uh, I'm an MFA candidate in poetry at Bowling Green State University. And um, I'm going to be sharing some poems from my thesis. Um, I came to, to Bowling Green with the intention of writing about like the last 10 years or so of my life. Um, for they've, they've weighed heavy on me. Um, and I haven't really engaged with them. Uh, sort of just kept moving through it all. Um, sort of backstory, you know, I you know came out of 
high school at 18, uh, year of college, and uh, decided that wasn't for me. Uh, I went into uh, emergency medical services. I uh, went to medic school, uh, became a paramedic, uh, and I loved it. I, I really had, uh, you know, a lot of my identity was wrapped up in uh, in being a medic, and it was it's a great job. I, I really loved it, but I was forced to walk away from the profession after three years. Uh, due to uh, some severe ankylosing spondylitis, which is uh, it's a it's a form of arthritis that focuses on your spine, and it's uh, uh, if you yeah, it's bad. <laughs> Essentially, it is not a it's not a great thing to have. Um, and you know, for after that, I kind of was just flailing, you know, just doing odd jobs. Um, I was hospitalized due to some uh, reactions with medications I was taking, um, years of physical therapy ongoing. I haven't really stopped. I can't really stop with it. Um, and diet and lifestyle changes, uh, all, uh, you know, having to do with managing my illness, which currently seems to be in remission-ish. Uh, you know, things are, things are pretty good now for me physically. Um, and they've led me here <laughs> talking to you on the computer, uh, which is really surreal, oddly. Uh, yeah, very strange. Um, so yeah, I'm going to share with you uh, a sample of some early drafts of poems uh, from, from this work that's really engaging, engaging with this part of my life. Um, so uh, the, the more I got into this, I... Uh, you know, I wanted to write more about just, you know, chronic pain and managing the illness, but uh, everything kept coming back to early childhood. Uh, I was surprised about how much how much of that has came up. Um, but really, part of the reason why all this is, has been so hard for me is just my identity in general uh, and just masculinity in the Midwest. Um, so uh, starting out... Uh, I have a few poems from the, uh, just talking about early childhood, about my childhood and just childhood in general. So this poem is called, And the World Becomes a Complicated Place. The wolves on the TV close in on the fawn, having ran it near death through miles of snow. No, my pounding, powerless heart. Leave her alone. Invested in the life we've been watching, learn to prance, to play with its forest siblings. But honey, my mother's arm is a comfort at times like these. The wolves have babies too. I think of the kitties in the Quonset, how their tiny clear claws hook in my shirt when I hold them close. Another poem about growing. Knee high by the 4th of July. We all grow in the dark. For proof, sit in your green rows past sundown. Listen to the tiny pops as stalks thicken, shoot inches higher in a single night. To grow so fast you explode. What great pain that must bring. Under my bed sheets, I feel it. The spirit throbs, radiates a gnaw from my shin to the knee's lower bump. By sunrise, there will be more of me, though you can't hear a thing. This one is called Tamping Posts. If you do this right, it'll stay. Pa augurs the post hole. The thick drill screeching, jerking as it chews through root and rock, spitting out mounds of black bile. My brother grunts a railroad tie from the trailer, hugs the dark beam and waddles it over to the thigh-deep hole. He aims the post, then drops it straight in, the thud shaking our feet. You've got an important job. I hold a time-browned steel bar, 
with which I tamp, tamp, tamp the base of the post. Pa holds it in place, square to its opposite across the pasture. Grandpa put that one up when he was in high school. I see it. Three railroad ties arranged in an L, still belaying their quarter mile of wire. Pa kicks in another layer of loose dirt for me to tamp down. If you do this part right, he says, it'll stay just as long. He kicks in some more, but only if you pack it tight the first time. Sweat drips off the tip of my nose as I adjust my stance to recruit my thighs, abs, lats, the tips of my toes into my important work, my body light with purpose. Um, another part of this project, um, I've been getting experimental with sonnets, uh, really inspired by uh, Terence Hayes uh, and also uh, Matthias Felina. Uh, they both have uh, um, collections out where they, they do a lot of experimentation with sonnets. Uh, so this is one uh, of my experimental sonnets about the body. So this one is called The Body is Symmetry. The body is of perfect symmetry, a marriage of odd lengths imperfect on their own. Unique transcends to unity as vibrant rays extend from centered dawn to meet the spinning earth or reach beyond. Inside each fluid joint, each pointed tooth, within the fissures of the skull is found countless rows of microscopic dominoes fell shredded by magnetic clumps of accident, snagging on their neighbors' entrails while they kink, twist, unzip, disintegrate to soaring dunes of slingshot shards, morphing to quantum aftershocks, eternal waves. In a word, chaos. Um, a significant part of, uh, of the project uh, is just engaging with the idea of masculinity in general, particularly in the Midwest, and, uh, and coming of age. Uh, so this, this poem engages with, with both of those. Uh, it's called Portrait of the Young Man. One. Portrait of the young man as he sees himself. Shiny brass, capped with lead, packed so tight a tap just right could make me fly blowing holes through walls, deer, bear, could rip through anything if given the chance. 2. Portrait of the young man as he desires to be. Dangerous, yet necessary. Blunt steel is tough enough by itself, but a steady aim defends a city, thwarts evil, puts food on the table. 3. Portrait of the Young Man The window sits in its cozy frame, glass so clear one sees a world that's still exciting, possible, new. It stands through wind, can take the rain, but don't be fooled, it's only as strong as its frame, as easily broken as pushed aside and one greasy touch is all it takes to ruin the view. In the work, I also uh, just write about what life was like working in EMS as a medic. Um, it's an exciting career, <laughs> that's for sure. You see some wild stuff. Um, and it's, it's hard to engage with it without being, I don't know, it's hard to be, to be graphic without being gratuitous sometimes. So I, I try to, to walk a line there. Um, so here's a few of, of my attempts anyway. Uh, this one is called Shotgun Mosaic. Red. All of it red. Red mottled with gray pulp smears the cornice in salmon jelly. 
runs in crimson down the white and gums to dark cherry at the baseboard. Peach chunks pasted at random sprout soft brown strands. Pale accents dot the soppy carpet. Thin moon cupped to hold gray pulp. Sharp stones tight in pink root. A fuzzy caterpillar resting on a peach ridge. This is another EMS poem next, and I have a phrase that I borrow from uh, fellow poets, uh, fellow BG poets, actually, uh, in my cohort here, uh, Alison uh, Mejia Santoro. Um, uh, she writes about the guts of stars and star guts in her work sometimes, and I just find that phrase just lovely and, and interesting. So, this poem title, When Rolling Over the Corpse, Gas Expels from the Mouth and Anus. There's likely a word for it, like the body length bruise named lividity, like the stiff jaw called rigor, though the proper term escapes me. Death burp? Death fart? And why is the scent so violent? Offensive, inherently bad. Because eating it would make you sick. Because touching it may give you a disease. Because methane, because necrosis, because the body mourns the soul. Does it really? Has anyone asked the body? Why would it? The soul is but a flighty thing that leaves when the fun's done. So is this rebellion? The fumes of revolution is this celebration at its peak. Or perhaps it's sweetness after all, perfume not meant for you or me, but for the guts of stars beneath our feet. Um, a big part of this project is, is writing about chronic pain and just dealing with it, you know, day in and day out. Um, and also all forms of pain, not just physical pain. Um, so this is one from, from that portion of the collection titled on calling my parents for money again, to flail beneath a sodium glow, to watch the city walk on by, who will I become? Do I have yet to form or is this what I'll be? to hover a finger over the key, to wait for a sign, to fog the windows inside out as you wait for a sign. Where am I? How did I get here? To triple check the math, to snow onto sky black tar. And it's not like I'm not trying. And it's not like this means nothing. To search and find only questions and new ways to lose. Uh, the last portion of the work um, is just about after, you know, just moving on. It's, you know, those who live with chronic pain, it's not like you know, a lot of times you write a story and there's the, the happy ending, there's before and after, but, you know, it just, it doesn't actually, there is no after, <laughs> you know, it just, you just keep going. Uh, and yeah, the, this last section, um, when I think about just keeping going, I think about my family a lot. Um, my, my family have, you know, they've been there through it all. Uh, and yeah, a lot of this, this last section deals with family and uh, yeah so this one is called Rainbow Chi Chi and it's uh, you know it's about my my brother and his daughter and family in general so Rainbow Chi Chi out on the back deck his daughter plays with plastic horses Hercules framed it out years ago, big enough to hold Sunday afternoon, 
warm planks stretching from the concrete step into the green yard, thick with kiddos. He planned to have it done in a weekend or two, and he would have too, till a spooked horse left him broken and cold miles from home. His first ambulance ride, then surgeries, pins, screws, pills, months of crutches, therapy, then a cane, and then slow walks down the gravel drive. In a year, he was chasing cows and powerlifting for fun, strong as ever, or pretty close. He tires in the evening now, stops to sip something cool on the deck. It's still numb. He traces a circle from his outer hip to knee, tingles after all this time. His daughter, Nays, canters her horsey on the picnic table, shakes her head of sandy curls to give a proper equine snort. She pauses, then informs us her name is Rainbow and her other name is Chi-Chi, before resuming her miniature adventures. Rainbow Chi-Chi, he says, smiling through tired eyes. What a pretty name. Uh, this work that I do, it's in the last section. I also want to just call in the question masculinity in general and just Midwestern culture at large. And uh, this last poem was written right around the 2016 election. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's about something I found on Facebook. And, uh, yeah, titled, Why Things Are the Way They Are. Drooling into my handheld addiction, scrolling, scrolling, a familiar face halts me. They're happy, an entire family complete with auxiliary uncles and grandmothers. Focus on the cheese covered runt in the high chair. Her face is squeezed with intense focus. Hiller. Hiller. No one moves. No one breathes. All are smiling, leaning inward. Hillary is gonna take our guns away. An eruption of applause. Daddy steps forward from behind the camera, plants one on her cheek. That's my girl. And uh, to end on a lighter note, just about surviving and, and keeping going. Uh, yoga has been huge. Yoga has been a game changer. Um, it's just in my life in so many ways, especially with dealing with my with my chronic pain. It's yeah, I, I can't stress enough how how much it's changed me just in general. Um, so yeah, this is this poem is called, I almost cried during internet yoga. Almost, had I not been actively trying not to die. And when you meet resistance, says the long calm lady on the TV, it's tempting to clench, to fight, but don't. There is sweat running down my body. An ugly collapse is imminent. Instead, just be. Find that edge, breathe deep, and just be. So I close my eyes and suck air. So I let my body quiver. And I am humming at a frequency. Frequencies. Somewhere, my chunky wavelengths are revered as hymns. And for a moment, I listen. And for a moment, I am. And I am made of atoms. And the space between them, too. And I am a parasite, freeloading off the universe. And no one owns me or owes me a damn thing. And I am afraid all the time. But I am not afraid right now. 
Well, thanks for thanks for listening. <laughs>